Hello, my name is Nathan Owens. I'm from UC San Diego Extension. Welcome to uh, the next webinar in our small business management series, Price, Cost, and Profit. Is that all there is to financials? I'd like to uh, welcome everybody here. Uh, appreciate you all attending. And uh, we've got another uh, great session for you. Dan Goldspan is back to do another session with us. So I'm thrilled to have him here. And I am just gonna do a quick uh, overview of today's agenda. So I am Nathan Owens, uh, Associate Director of Strategic Initiatives here at Extension. This is one of the things I've been doing is putting together this series. Uh, we are recording today's session and uh, we will post it on our YouTube channel. Uh, it usually takes about a week or two and then if you want to go back and refer to it, you'll have it there. Uh, also, for those of you in attendance, I will send out a copy of Dan's slide deck because he does have a lot that he's going to cover in there. And so you can kind of go back and refer to a lot of things he describes today. Quickly, I will introduce Dan before turning things over. Uh, he has been a longtime uh, instructor here at UCSD Extension, I believe 23 years, which we're grateful for. Uh, he is also a uh, very active in, in the business world. He's been working for companies like Bank of America and BioLegend and General Dynamics and Carl Zeiss Vision. So he has a lot of real world experience that he's gonna share with you today. So if you do have questions for Dan, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, if it's uh, sort of a fundamental question, we can stop and address it right then. Otherwise, we'll leave time at the end for, for Dan to answer those for you. But definitely encourage you to put your, your questions at any time in the chat. We'll go over them. Real quick about Extension, if you are not familiar with UCSD Extension, we are the professional and continuing education arm of UC San Diego. Typically people think about night, evening classes, that kind of sort of thing, which we do offer, but we're also a lot more. So we have K through 12 programs. We have programs for those who are retired. We have public events. We have a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, we are in many ways like a university within the university and uh, offer over 4,000 different courses with over a thousand instructors. Uh, excellent experience, people like Dan. For this series, I have a couple partners that uh, I've been working with for the last couple of years. These are two co-working spaces located in downtown San Diego. And they, they are Downtown Works and Cross Campus. Fortunately, we haven't been able to do any of the in-person sessions for quite a while, but I do hope at some point that we can go back to doing that. They have some excellent spaces. And so if you are interested in any type of co-working and happen to be in San Diego, definitely feel free to check them out. For the small business series, we have uh, two scheduled for the next couple of weeks, uh, the, or three weeks. Uh, the uh, next one is on August 20th, next week all about storytelling to authentically capture, captivate your customers. This is uh, done by Chris Foster, who's also been part of this small business series on a couple of occasions. And then the following one on September 10th is about how to be more strategic with your talent acquisition. And that will feature another extension instructor, Michael McGinnis. These two are things that a lot of small businesses uh, try to do a better job at. And so we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to learn some practical guidance from, from these two individuals. Also in parallel to the series is the leadership and management webinar series, which I noticed a lot of you have attended. Uh, I will drop links to both of these uh, webinar series if you want to check out what's coming up. Uh, these are all free and open for anybody to attend. So here's the URL for the Small Business Management Series. And like I said, I'll put the, uh, this and then the other one uh, for the Leadership and Management Series into the chat here in a second. Lastly, before I turn things over to Dan, uh, this series I've tried really hard to make it as relevant and useful to the small business community tried to source almost all of my topics from people such as yourself. So if you do have suggestions, please feel free to shoot me an email and I will do what I can to see if I can put something together for you. As I mentioned, we have over a thousand instructors here at Extension, so there's a very good chance that I can find a subject matter expert who can cover that topic for you. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and let Dan take things from there. So it's all yours, Dan. All right. Welcome to the presentation. Thank you for the introduction, Nathan. Uh, 
I'm very pleased to be associated with UCSD and I would have a lot more nice things to say about it, but in the words from a film from my youth, Smokey and the Bandit, we have a long way to go today and not much time to get there. So we're gonna to to jump right in. Uh, the presentation will take upwards of 40 minutes and it is divided into uh, two overall sections. We're gonna start with the big picture and then we're gonna have a section for each of the basic financial statements. We will recap at the end of each of these four sections and give you a chance to ask questions at that time, uh, particularly uh, if there's a, something you need clarification on uh, so that you don't have to wait until the end and try to remember what it is that you didn't understand. Let us begin with the big picture. Now, when you start a company, uh, assuming you already have a product or service in mind, what do you need? You need capital and it comes from investors. And uh, before I go any further, uh, I want to say that this model that I'm about to reveal in this screen is how I want you to think about a company always in financial terms. There are many other ways to think about it, but this is the financial model. Investors provide capital. They provide it in two forms, either as equity, ownership shares, or in debt, that is lending money. But they're both capital. They're both investments in the company. I like to say they are both the same color green, but they're done under different kinds of contracts. In any event, that process is the financing step. And once that capital is acquired, it is then invested in capital assets or product development. And I should say, by the way, that this financing and investment phase may happen one time. Other companies may do it repeatedly particularly large industrial companies are constantly raising new capital um, and reinvesting it. Other ventures may do so only one time. Those capital assets or the, the IP that's developed in the investing area are then used in operations and they generate, we hope, a positive operating cash flow. That positive operating cash flow, or the expectation for it, is going to be the source, either directly or indirectly, of the repayment and return to the investors on their investment. If it is a direct return, it's in the form of principal paybacks, interest, dividends, and stock buybacks. If it's indirect, it is just uh, the basis for the market to value the stock more highly. Each of these steps is reflected in certain parts of the basic financial statements, which is what we're talking about this morning. The financing and the investment go into the financing and the investing section of the cash flow statements. Operations show up in the income statement as well as the cash flow statement. There's also the balance sheet, but I'm not putting it on this slide. We have enough items already. You will see all these items reflected later on in the presentation. So moving on, we look at the primary purpose of accounting and it is to provide information about a company's financial performance and its condition. Specifically, to provide it to outside parties. It's used by management as well, but it was primarily conceived in order to inform outside parties about the company's finances so that one, they can assess the company's prospective income and cash flows and thus its market value and make an ownership investment decision and to assess the financial resources of the company in order to determine whether it's worth lending money to. Can it repay its debts? Of course, management also uses the financial statements and the larger a company is, the more dependent management is to understand the operation of the whole. There are several, of course, as I just said, several specific purposes to accounting and each one has a particular financial statement associated with it. The requirement to present earnings during the period is satisfied by the income statement the requirement to provide, to present. The financial condition at the end of the period is satisfied by the balance sheet. 
the requirement to pre present all the cash flows during the period is satisfied by the cash flow statement. There are two other requirements, and they are satisfied by two financial statements that we're not going to talk about. I don't mean to diminish their importance, but they just aren't the topic for this webinar. There are certain fundamental accounting principles that are applied in, to, in creating these financial statements. One is the historic cost basis of valuation. All the values that you see on a financial statement are the values of the items when they were created. If an asset on the balance sheet was bought 10 years ago, it is still presented at that historic cost, no matter what has happened to its market value since then. They use the accrual basis of accounting, the matching principle is applied, and there has to be full disclosure. We're not gonna talk about full disclosure, but absolutely you must adhere to it. The accrual basis of accounting and the matching principle, we're going to talk about in the context of the income statement. So they may be foreign words to you now, but don't worry, they will be addressed. In fact, let's do that right away. The basis of accounting. There are two bases for accounting, two ways to look at the activities that accounting is summarizing and presenting. The first one is the cash basis, and it recognizes revenue and expenses only once cash is received or paid. You and I are on the cash basis. That's how we look at ourselves. But companies are not or shouldn't be. Companies, at least of any size, should be on the accrual basis. And that means they recognize revenues, not when the check finally comes in, but when they've earned them under the contract and are confident of their ability to collect them. And they recognize expenses, not when they write the check, but when those expenses are incurred, that is, when those resources are consumed. These are measurements of economic activities, not transactions, and the two major set of regulations and standards, standards is a better word, of accounting, the generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP in the US, and international financial reporting standards in the rest of the world, both require the use of the accrual basis. It's less susceptible to manipulation, and it reflects the underlying economic events that you wanna talk about, not the timing of payments and receipts which can distort the actual financial activity. So the three basic financial statements we're going to cover are the profit and loss statement or the income statement, the balance sheet and the cash flow statement. You can see their purposes here. And when they are presented, they are typically presented in several years. Uh, three years statements for the profit and loss or the cash flow statement, two years for the balance sheet under GAAP, three years under IFRS. I agree with IFRS. I don't know why we only present two years for the balance sheet. Let's have a look at the first one. But first, let me ask if there are any questions on the big picture. And Nathan, if you could have a look at the chat, please, because I'm in the middle of the presentation. Let me ask if anyone has any quick questions to clarify anything on the capital cycle phases, the purpose of accounting, or the fundamental accounting principles. Um, I think I'm going to escape out of here for the moment and look at the... No, no questions yet. They might question. be furiously typing, but... Okay. We'll give everybody a moment there. We'll go back to the presentation then. I'm assuming there are no questions. If there are, there'll be opportunities later on to ask them. So the income statement, we're gonna discuss its underlying logic, its character and structure, its major components, revenue expenses, and some of the major expense categories. And finally, how to evaluate the income statements. There's a way to read them. There's a way to understand them. First of all, the structure. 
The income statement reports performance, and it does it according to the general formula for performance, accomplish minus accomplishments minus the efforts necessary to achieve them. In financial terms, that means revenues or sales minus the associated expenses. The net difference between them is earnings or profit, or sometimes, I'm sorry to say, losses. I didn't write that down, but it can happen. The important point to understand is that a company's financial performance, whether it makes positive earnings or losses, will increase or decrease the wealth of the owners in that company in the form of the value of their investment in the company. And that's what accounting is trying to measure. It's trying to measure how much the owner's investment in the company is worth. Finance does the same thing and it comes up with completely different numbers because accounting only considers everything that has happened up through yesterday on an historical basis. Finance looks at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning into the future to say all the things we expect to happen, how much would I pay for them now? You can see these are two very different numbers and yet they're absolutely dependent upon each other. By the way, you're going to find in your careers that there are multiple names for statements, especially the profit and the income statement. I like to call it the P&L, short for the profit and loss statement. Some companies and some industries call it the statement of operations. Some call it the statement of earnings. Are there other statement names? You better believe it. I once worked for a company. It was privately held. It didn't publish its statements publicly. It could call them anything it wanted. And it called the income statement the management report. There are other management reports, folks. But I got used to that. Those managers, they knew what they were doing. They were very sharp. If they wanted to call it the management report, I just deferred to Shakespeare and said, a rose by any other name is still a rose. And frankly, those managers were pretty good gardeners. So they called it that. It was still the income statement and they used it properly. Here is an income statement. It's from a company called Kohu up in Poway. It's publicly held. So all of this information is publicly available. I worked for Kohu for many years. It's a pretty simple company and an excellent example to use. Notice on the right, we have three columns of figures, one for each of three years, and it is traditional to present them in the order, in the order of the most recent one being the closest to the descriptions. I don't like that myself. In my world, time moves from left to right but it's traditional to present them this way. Some companies do present them the other way. So when you read another company's uh, financial statements, take note to see what order they're presenting the years. Don't wanna misinterpret them. The items in blue are the major expense items. The items in black are the major performance items. And the items in red are very common acronyms for certain items in there. Kohu is in the semiconductor business. It makes uh, certain kinds of machinery that are used in semiconductor manufacturing. If any of you know anything about the semiconductor business, you know that it is absolutely volatile as can be. It's nothing but ups and downs. And you can see that in the top line. Look, starting from the right, at how Kohu's revenues, its sales, jumped from 2009 to 2010. Look at the bottom line. You can see how its net income moved also. And this is a very common pattern at Kohu. And that's why they have a lot of cash on hand to get them through those bottom, uh, those bottom times. Oh, let's see. Oh, yes. The net income, by the way, is often called the bottom line. Someone once asked me, what's the top line? The top line are sales. Finally, I want to stress, these numbers don't mean cash. And one thing I always admonish my students is don't ever use the word money unless you actually mean cash. 
I violate this rule myself sometimes, but it's a way to remember that these numbers don't represent cash, they represent values. Values which may or may not have yet been turned into or spent in cash, but they represent eventual, if not historic, movements of cash. Revenue, by the way, I wanna say a bit about it. Revenue or net sales is the most fundamental measure of a company's size. When you talk about how big a company is, unless it's a financial company with a lot of financial assets, you talk about its revenue, its sales. You don't talk about its employees. You don't talk about its, its uh, uh, number of facilities. You talk about its sales because trading with its customers is the most fundamental thing a company does and everything else is derived from that. And speaking of the derivation of things from sales, let's look at a depiction here of how the income statement is structured. You can think of it as a funnel with holes in the side and pouring into the top of the funnel are the sales and streaming out the sides are the expenses till what is left at the bottom is the net income. That bottom area is usually a whole lot, is really a whole lot narrower in proportion to the top, but <laughs> I couldn't make it as small. One thing that um, people are often surprised at when they start looking at company financial statements is how small the net income typically is compared to sales, particularly in capital intensive companies. Let's look at the uh, income statement again to learn more about its structure and its character. The expenses that are listed, and I have presented expenses here in uh, parentheses. That is not normally done on a published financial statement. I like to do it because visually it makes it a little easier when you can see that inflows are positive and outflows uh, or uses of resources are negative. But those expenses are categorized by their purpose. Cost of sales, that's the expenses of what was necessary to create the goods or services that were sold. R&D, research and development, the expenses that were incurred to conduct R&D, the expenses that were incurred in order to administrate the company and run the selling and marketing operations. There was no debt uh, on Cohue's books at this time. So there was no interest income, rather no interest expense, but they had some interest income. And finally, as we move down this P&L, we see the provision for income taxes, another expense. That's not the size of the check they wrote to the IRS. They prepared the statement months before they finished doing their income statements. It is an estimate. So we have expenses that are categorized by purpose. And it's important to the prospective investors to understand this. How much is the company spending on future development? How much does it cost to run the company? What's the gross margin in their sales? We'll get to all that in a little while. But also, if you move from top to bottom, you will see a change in relationship with outside parties. Sales represent how much the company's assets increased by virtue of trading with their customers. How much richer is the company because it delivered on a contract and it will be rewarded for that. The expenses are all representative of asset decreases that represent the expenditure or the surrender of resources necessary to create items for sale or run the company. Excuse me there. So those are all asset decreases. And that means at the end, we get a residual, that net income, which as I said earlier, is an, a number that expresses how much more or less the owner's investment in the company is worth. So this statement is really a statement of transformation. It's at the top, it's discussing how the company relates to its customers. In the middle, it discusses how the company relates to its resources. And at the end, it discusses how the company relates to its owners. That's a little esoteric, but it is a very holistic view. 
it represents transfers of value from, owner, from customers at the top to owners at the bottom. But then it leads to another question. Okay, we know why we have net sales at the top because it's the, the relationship with customers. We know how, that we have net income at the bottom because it's the relationship with the owners. But why are these other expenses presented in the order that they are? Why is, re why is research and development presented in the middle, not at the top? It turns out that the items are listed in order of decreasing relationship to the revenue event. The more it's related to revenue, the higher up it is. Of course, cost of sales is absolutely re related to revenue. R&D is not really related to the revenue of this period, but to the next period. So it's strongly associated with future revenue. Selling general and administrative is maybe some related to revenue. That's the selling expenses. General and administrative, not so much related to revenue. So it's even lower. Taxes are absolutely not related to the revenue event, so they're at the bottom. So you have a very holistic, conceptual view of the income statement. Hey, Dan, quick question. Uh, can you explain what operating revenue is and if it's any different than anything you described there? Not op operating revenue or operating income. Sorry, so operating mean, income. Operating income is revenue minus the cost of sales minus R&D and selling and, and, and uh, selling general administrative. That is the remainder that's, that's left before you pay any financing costs. So no matter how the company would be financed, did, did it borrow money, did it not borrow money, did it sell more stock in itself, did it sell less stock, that number would always be the same. It's the basis for valuing a company. That hope, I hope that answers the question in a real brief nutshell. And it's a good one because that is a very important number, the operating income. Let's look at revenue a bit. I said it's really the recognition of an asset increase uh, that is in consideration for providing a customer or client with goods or services. It's recognized when two things happen, a company has performed under its contract with the customer that it is, has earned the revenue and it is realizable. That is, the company reasonably expects they're actually going to get the cash. Remember, most companies, when they do business with other companies, they do it on credit. When Cohue sells one of its machines to Intel, Intel doesn't come around with a credit card they ship the machine to China or Costa Rica or someplace and they send an invoice. Several weeks later, Intel pays them. So that's what I mean by realizable. Intel's credit is good. So Cohue has every reason to believe that they will be paid for this so they re and they know they ship the machine so they've, they recognize the revenue at that moment. And that initial asset increase, therefore, it doesn't have to be cash. Uh, it's normally accounts receivable, or in the case of revenue of retail companies rather now, retail companies, credit card receivables. Those typically come in in one or two days, but the moment you buy something at a retail establishment and use your credit card, the company doesn't get the cash at that moment. It gets it after a day's settlement or so. By the way, revenue does not include customer deposits or advance payments because the company hasn't earned anything, hasn't delivered under the contract at that point. Expenses are resources expended, or maybe the obligations incurred for those resources, in order to generate revenue or, or otherwise operate the companies. And this is where I want to talk about the matching principle. You only recognize expenses if the resource expenditure generates revenue during that same period or it enables the business to function during that same period. For instance, if you spend $100,000 to make a product, a unit of product, and you don't sell it in that period, you don't recognize it as an expense. You've got an asset, a $100,000 asset, sitting in the warehouse waiting for someone to buy it. Once they buy it, only then does it get recognized as an expense. And operating expenses like research and development and selling general administrative 
are actually expensed when they're incurred, even if they're future oriented. So if you're doing R&D now to develop a future product, you're still going to recognize that expense now. Uh, we, we do that because of the uncertainty around uh, R&D. Uh, we don't know if it's really going to work or not, so we expense it now to be conservative. The major expense categories are cost of sales, and those are the costs of the goods or services that are actually delivered to customers per contract. You may not realize this, but every time you enter into a transaction with anybody on any basis, you've got a contract. It's probably not written down. But you, when you walk up to In-N-Out and buy a hamburger, order a hamburger, the moment you've ordered the hamburger, there's a contract between you and In-N-Out. And when they give you that hamburger, they have delivered on the contract and they can recognize the revenue. Actually, you pay them for that food before you get it. Theoretically, in the five minutes it takes them to cook that meal, they have cash on hand, if you paid in cash, that they haven't earned yet. They don't earn it until they put that food on the counter for you to pick up. If a company is making goods but hasn't delivered them yet, they can't recognize the uh, revenue at that time. A very unpleasant example is the Boeing company, which has hundreds of air and undelivered aircraft sitting on the ground. They haven't been delivered. They can't recognize the revenue for the sale of those planes. They've collected about two thirds because Boeing wants a third of the price when the contract is signed. They want a third of the price when the plane is painted and a third of the price when it's actually delivered to the airline. But as far as recognizing the revenue, they haven't recognized any of the revenue on those undelivered aircraft. They're still in inventory. Then there's SG&A, and these are not product costs, not the costs of the company's goods and services, but there are other expenses that are necessary to operate the company. Um, companies might include research and development within SG&A, or they might present it on their income statement separately if it's a very important part of the company. Here in San Diego, with a lot of research-oriented companies, we are used to seeing R&D as a separate item on the income statement. But if you were to look at the income statement, say for Walmart, you would not see a category called research and development. You would not see that expense. Even though Walmart does research and development, one of their labs is up in Carlsbad, as a matter of fact, and the amount of money, oh, I said money, bad, my bad. The amount that of R&D expense that Walmart incurs is actually bigger than most R&D expenditures by most small San Diego companies that do present R&D as a separate item on their P&L. But it's still so small at Walmart compared to all their other expenses, it's not presented separately. And in spite of the fact that it is important, it's not so fundamental to Walmart's goods and products that it should be presented separately. A research company wants to present R&D separately on its income statement because the investors really want to know how much they're spending toward future product development. Other income and expenses, I don't wanna go into them at this time, but these are some that you'll find uh, on some income statements, certainly taxes on all of them. Back to our income statement, just to refresh your memory here. And you can see now that looking at a few of these lines, sales changed radically over time. Research and development, that Fourth line, it went up substantially from 2009 to 2010. The net income went up enormously. How do you compare one year to another? Or if you're evaluating two different companies, how do you compare their income statements? They're always, each year is always going to be a different size. Activities are always going to vary between years. 
There are two major ways we look at income statements in order to evaluate them. The first is to look at what I like to call levels of performance. And in an income statement, there are four levels of performance. The person who asked the question about operating income, here's where we come back to your question. The first level is revenue. That is a legitimate level of performance. The second level is gross profit, revenue minus the cost of everything you sold in order to make that gross profit. The third level is operating income or EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes. That's where you take the gross profit and you subtract out the non-product, non-financial costs that were incurred. And then finally, once you subtract interest and other expenses, you get taxable income, you take out taxes, and you get to net income. If you were to take that gross profit figure or that EBIT number, or that net income figure, the actual dollar measurement, and you were to divide it by the revenue number, you would get a percentage. And those percentages are called margins. Off to the right, you, the percentage that gross profit is of revenue is the gross margin. The percentage that operating income is of revenue is the operating margin. And of course, net income divided by revenue is the net margin. There's one other event measure of performance. It's at the bottom here. You can notice it at the bottom of the income statement here, the earnings per share. Don't want to go into that in too, in too much detail, but it is required for publicly held companies that they divide their net incomes by the numbers of shares that are outstanding. It's another easy way for prospective investors and actual investors to compare their stock investments in different companies. If you can see on a per share basis, how is your investment in Cohu during, doing versus say your investment in, oh, I don't know, IBM for instance, or Intel, or Joe's Bar and Grill, if you bought stock in them. The other way to evaluate an income statement builds on this idea of margin, and it is called vertical analysis. You set, you divide every item in the income statement by the net sales or revenue item. So of course, then the net sales is going to be 100%. And you come up with a percentage figure for every single one of those items. Uh, some are unimportant, of course, but I've kept them all here for completeness. And then you can compare the vertical analysis and percentages by year to other years by this company or to the same year against the vertical analysis of other companies. For instance, in this year of 2010, Cohu spent 11% of its sales or an amount equal to 11% of its sales on R&D. Now, I don't wanna say exactly where the cash came and went, but it's a measure of intensity of R&D. And then you can compare that to other years and you can compare it to other companies to compare how much of the revenue is being reinvested into the company. So those are the two ways you look at, R and at uh, income statements to evaluate them. Uh, any questions on P&Ls here? Yeah, one just came in. So okay. uh, on that previous slide, are there standards for those margins? There are norms. <laughs> I would not say there are standards. Um, but if, if you were a stock analyst, for instance, following a certain industry, you would note that for the most part, they tended to be similar simply because of what is necessary to succeed in a given industry. And you would take note when they changed by company. Um, sometimes you'll see them quite a bit different. Uh, if you were to look at Amazon or Apple's vertical analysis, you'd see much higher measure, uh, net margins than in other companies because those companies just sell so incredible much uh, at low costs that they're keeping a whole lot of their income. So I wouldn't say there are standards, but there certainly are norms. Um, if you are the controller or the chief financial officer 
of a company or the CEO of a company, it would probably behoove you to be monitoring the same uh, statistics, the same evaluations for other major companies in your industry and for your competitors to have an idea of the whole, just as you know, the coach of any sports team is gonna be watching the records of all the other teams in the league. It's exactly the same thing. Awesome, and somebody just dropped a, a link to, uh, I guess where you can find some description of, of certain norm. Is there other places or, or uh, organizations that help define oh, yeah. these norms? Oh yeah, there's all kinds of stuff out there, all kinds of stuff out there. Um, Warning, if you take my class, I make you do it yourself. <laughs> but that's because it's the easiest way. Once you've learned to crunch these numbers, you absolutely don't want to spend your time doing it. You want to be able to just find it somewhere else. Uh, but yeah, there's a, a lot of this information. And uh, um, I think probably you know, Yahoo Finance has a bunch. Uh, there's all kinds of sources, all kinds of sources. Great, thanks. So uh, if there are no other questions, uh, we'll move on then to the balance sheet. Uh, again, we're gonna look at purpose, structure, and logic. We're gonna look at its components and specific items. The balance sheet describes financial condition at the end of a period. And that means it's going to have the assets, that is the financial resources, and then the liabilities against those resources with owner's equities being the difference. This is a formula. And there's a very important notion to it that a company in financial terms exists for the benefit of its uh, owners and its creditors. It does, none of its equity is for its own benefit. You have assets equal to all the claims against the assets by outside parties. Financially, a company is in business for the benefit of its outside parties. This is even true in a non-financial sense, and I'm very glad that there has been so much attention lately to companies' non-financial constituencies, citizenry, um, employees, the environment, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're all obligated to outside society. So let's move on and look at these things. Um, here is a little more detail on what I just said. Um, you have the basic accounting formula, assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. Um, those liabilities are the obligations to non-owners, employees, vendors, creditors, government, anyone to whom the company has a financial obligation but does not have it to that entity as an owner. It is possible, by the way, for the same person to be both an owner and a lender but your, the different obligations that the company has to you will be presented at different points in the balance sheet. Again, everything on a balance sheet is presented in terms of historic costs, not current values. And the assets and liabilities, as you'll see in a moment, are grouped in two groups, current and non-current. Finally, that owner's equity area, and especially the retained earnings account do not represent a specific bank account or asset. It's just the difference. These are analogous to your personal net worth. If you were to take all of your cash, uh, the value of uh, your house or condo if you own it, your investments, your retirement funds, and you were to subtract out all the debt that you owed, and the five bucks you owe your friend for the, the beer he, he bought for you, the difference is your net worth but you probably couldn't find a specific bank account that had that amount of, of value in it. It's an accounting number. So here is part of the balance sheet of Cohue. These are only the assets. I'll show you the, uh, uh, the liabilities and equities in the next slide. And you can see at the top, the current assets. And you can see at the bottom, what are the non-current assets? Or, uh, and uh, the current assets are all listed in the order of how soon they are expected to turn into cash. It starts with cash, short-term investments, accounts receivable, that is what the customers owe, that'll turn into cash next. Inventories will turn into cash later, and then deferred income taxes and other current assets even after that. Property, plants, and equipment are listed generally in these categories. Less accumulated depreciation and amortization, I'll get to that in a moment. 
giving us the net figure. That's the figure that's going to show up on the balance sheet. Goodwill, I will also talk about in a moment. Um, intangible assets. And note the bottom line numbers here. Uh, $362 million. These figures are all in thousands. In 2011, 366 million in 2010. The bottom numbers in a balance sheet are called the footings. Note those footings because on the other side of the balance sheet, they are the same down at the bottom. A balance sheet balances. So this means that everything that the accounting system says the company owns is subject to a claim from, the, from some outside party. The current liabilities accounts payable to vendors, accrued compensation, those are owed to employees, the amount that they think they're still going to have to pay under warranties, profits that are deferred, income taxes that are payable but haven't been paid yet, other liabilities that they haven't paid yet. So at the end of 2011, Kohu said, we owe $71 million to people that we have to pay within the year. That's not a whole lot compared to $362 million or $71 million versus $362 million of total resources. This is a strong company because the proportion of liabilities, that is obligations to non-owners is very small compared to the amount of total financial resources. Down here under stockholders equity, the company is not under any obligation to pay out any of these amounts to their owners. That's only done at the discretion of the board of directors. But let's have a look. At the end of 2011, Kohu had raised the sum of $24 million and $78 million in capital from selling its stock and had accumulated $189 million of net income that had not yet been distributed to owners in the form of dividends. So again, a very strong company. There are several items on the balance sheet that are always confusing, legitimately so, to a beginning accounting students. Some of you may not be beginning accounting students. And I would ask you to hold on while I get through these. Let's have a look at each of them. Accumulated depreciation. Now, when a company buys a capital asset, like an airplane, like a ship, like a piece of manufacturing equipment, say it spends, if it, in the case of an airplane, and I gave this example in my talk a month ago, you buy a 737, you pay 25 or 50, say $50 million for it. You do not expense $50 million in the year that you bought it because you're going to use that asset over time. And the matching principle says you have to match the consumption of a resource with the revenue it generates. So if you sell five or $10 million of tickets a year on that plane and you do it, or you expect to do it for 25 years, you're going to expense $2 million of that plane's acquisition costs against that ticket revenue every year of depreciation. In ordinary time, in ordinary language, depreciation refers to how much uh, an item loses in market value, not in accounting. In accounting, it means how much of an asset's cost is applied every period as an expense against the revenues that it's generated. And all of that depreciation gets added up I'll go back to this slide. Notice less accumulated depreciation and amortization. Of the $81 million, you can see that figure in, in italics about halfway down the, uh, the uh, balance sheet, gross, tangible, non-current assets. At the end of 2011, Kohu had about $81 million of tangible gross assets, of which they had depreciated a little more than half. That means that in accounting's very specific and limited view, 
there was $37 million left of productive capability in those assets. That doesn't mean that Cohue can't use the asset after it's fully depreciated financially, and you can keep flying the 737 after it's fully depreciated. As a matter of fact, decades ago, Northwest Airlines, which long since became part of Delta, was famous for keeping its planes forever and taking really good care of them, but fully depreciating them so that after a while, the depreciation expense on a plane would end because it was fully depreciated. And that's why in its many of its years, Northwest was very profitable because it didn't have very much depreciation expense. Now, that's a limited view. Accounting saying that the total productive capability of these assets is $81 million. But accounting is conservative and it's based on actual historic costs. Back to our definitions here. So total depreciation expense incurred for capital assets is the accumulated depreciation. Here's my little blurb on conservatism. Accounting is very concerned with not overstating asset values and not misleading a reader of the financial statement. Then there's goodwill. This is the real confusing one. When a company buys another company, it brings that company's assets onto its balance sheet at their current accounting values, their historic cost minus the incurred depreciation so far. Well, of course, you're gonna pay a lot more for a company because you're buying its future potential, not its historic performance. So if you bring on, say, $25 million of net asset value and you paid $100 million for it, $100 million is leaving your company, you gotta show $100 million coming in. The other $75 million is goodwill. It has nothing to do with how much your customers love you. And it has to be evaluated every year because if that company you bought turns out not to be worth what you paid for it, you have to write down the goodwill and declare a loss. Some of you may remember that some years ago, Hewlett Packard bought an English software company and paid billions of dollars for it. It turned out to be worthless. And Hewlett Packard, several years later, had to take a huge loss in writing down the goodwill from the purchase of that company. Par value and paid in capital, I don't want to spend much time on. You don't really have to worry about them uh, at this point. Uh, the par value is really based on very antiquated uh, laws. Um, and paid in capital, as I said earlier, is the amount of value that a company receives for selling its own stock. But remember, once that stock is sold, and if it is ever sold to another investor, that is not reflected on the company's books. Just as when Ford sells an Explorer to a dealer, and the, that's the revenue that Ford recognizes, when the dealer sells the car to a customer, or when the customer trades, into the, trades the car in, it has no effect on Ford at all. So when a company's stock trades between investors in the market, that doesn't affect the company's finances at all. It's only that first sale of the stock by the company to the initial outside investor that creates paid in capital. Any questions on the balance sheet? Not seeing anything yet, but we're almost at noon, Dan, so. All right, well, I'm gonna run through cash flow real fast. Okay. It's important to understand where the cash is coming from and where it's going. You remember this model? Every one of these cash flow statements, and this is Amazon's, has a section reflecting this model. Uh, without going into detail, I just want to let you know about operating cash flow, investing cash flow, and financing cash flow. Operating, and let's look at these three separately. Here is investing and cash flow. Investing cash flow is how you invest that capital, and it's normally negative because usually you're spending money. That's the first orange highlighted line. 
The second orange highlighting line, highlighted line is financing. It can either be positive or negative, depending upon whether a company is raising money, then it's positive, raising capital, it's positive, or returning capital to its investors, then it's negative. Operating cash flow, we hope is positive. And you can see at the bottom here that Amazon's has gone up considerably. Amazon agrees with me. It puts the columns in the order going from left to right. Every, um, we're not gonna go into the details of how these uh, statements are constructed. I just want to summarize them. So here's the summary. You start with cash and equivalents at the beginning of the period at the top. You add the cash flows from operating, investing, and financing. Those are the three orange subtotals. And then they give you at the bottom the cash at the end of the period. The balance sheet will tell you the cash at the end of the period, but it won't tell you how it changed from year to year. That's the cash flow statement's job. So I will leave uh, questions for that uh, to the end of the period. And I would say, Is that all there is? Is that all there is? Well, no, that is not all there is. There is a whole lot more, but we don't have time to go into it, and it actually takes a good deal of time. So I would refer you to the next step. We have an excellent course at Extension called Financial Accounting for Non-Accountants. Here is the link to it. And for those of you who are interested in more training, I would suggest you look at our specialized programs, the LAMP and EPSI program for engineers, and we have certificates in finance, accounting, and business analytics. I'm working on the business analytics one myself. So I'll take any questions. I thank you, if there are none. The, um, thanks, one, Dan. There yeah. is one. Uh, oh, the difference between generally accepted accounting principles and government accounting principles or nonprofit accounting principles. Uh -huh. A whole course. <laughs> but most of the underlying concepts are the same. Accrual basis, historic cost, um, the, ma the, the, the matching principle. The major difference is fund accounting. You maintain separate books for different funds. Companies do not do fund accounting. They conglomerate it all together. All right, thanks. Ton of information was covered. Uh, we did have to breeze through it quickly. So uh, oh, yeah. I will uh, thank everybody for attending. Thank Dan for his excellent presentation and trying to break down the stuff, which can seem complicated to people who aren't familiar with looking at these numbers. And uh, everyone who was signed in today uh, to attend, I'll get this slide deck out to you so you can refer back to it. And if you do want to do a deeper dive on this, be sure to check out the link that Dan is showing right there for his excellent uh, finance and accounting for non-accountants class. And with that, thank you. I hope everybody has a great rest of their day and uh, hope to see you in the next webinar. Stay healthy, everyone. Bye.